So I thought about uh, the topic I would speak about today, and um, I imagined um, three different scenarios of uh, conditions that I frequently encounter. Um, concussions or mild TBIs, um, what is called hemiparesis, and then other movement disorders. Um, when I think about general physiotherapy intervention guidelines, really what I'm talking about is what, what does a physio do when we see somebody with a concussion, a hemiparesis or any kind of movement disorder? And I'm just going to kind of come up with a little list of interventions. Um, we can talk about exercise prescription. We can talk about movement analyses. We can talk about manual therapy, acupuncture, myofascial releases, and electrotherapy, and a whole bunch of other techniques that we have at our fingertips to treat the condition that you might have. Um, so let me just briefly tell you a bit about myself, which is not my favorite topic, but I will anyways. Um, so I'm the owner and operator of, of Bergen Motion. It's a family-owned uh, physiotherapy clinic in Barrie. Um, there is six of us and four of them are our physios, um, including my two daughters who are physios and my nephew. So we started this clinic with two business partners as well and um, are having a good time and really a lot of fun. So we see a variety of people and have a very large neurological uh, community that comes and sees us. Um, my journey started many years ago, obviously you can probably tell by my, the color of my hair. Um, I started in Argentina. Uh, that's where I did my, my education. Um, and I basically left Argentina right after I graduated and moved to Switzerland, where I worked in a rehab center for about six years. It's really inside of that time that I, uh, developed sort of the love of working with individuals with neurological conditions. It's, it's been a, uh, a learning journey for me as well. Everybody has taught me a lot of things and then I took quite a few courses. So I came, into Can I came to Canada in 1986 where I, I got married and I've had uh, three children, um, but I've continued with, with the learning, uh, with all the learning around, around neurological conditions. And there's several different techniques that I've kind of gathered over time um, there are some um, aqua therapy techniques that I brought from Switzerland. Um, I did PNF and Boboth courses. I took NDT, which is neurodevelopment therapy in Canada, certifications for that. So yeah, so here I am and still learning. How's that? I hope to learn for many more years. So um, just a quick uh, definition, not a definition, but an explanation of uh, what NDT is. Um, or neurodevelopment therapy, um, it allowed me to, to understand how to create a pathway between the goal, the, the client or the individual's goals, whatever that is, people have many different goals that they want to achieve, and connecting it with their abilities. So kind of finding a way to get from where you are today to hopefully reaching your goals. I'm not promising, but I certainly try and move somebody in that direction. And I'll speak a bit more about that as I go along, just to give a few examples. Um, I don't know where everybody is at with their physical um, um, status at this point, but I'm going to just use some examples that have come up in my, in my practice. So let's go to the concussion or mild TBI. Uh, which is the next slide. Um, and just briefly a, a comment on how do we get these concussions and mild TBIs? I mean, there's so many different ways. Um, you know, one is very typical through sports, just an idea, soccer, two individuals, two players hitting their head when they go up for a ball, one of them. Um, hockey, um, slamming your head into the boards or, or hitting it on the ice, right? Even with a helmet on. Um, we also have motor vehicle accidents where, you know, the accident happens and we hit our head on the wind, windshield, you know, and are likely going to have an additional condition, which is called the whiplash. So those are just simple examples. I have a, a, a young lady who actually was hit 
by a hammer. So it's neither sport nor is it um, nor is it an MVA. So there's so many different conditions that where you actually end up with a concussion or a mild TBI. Um, let me go to the next slide here. So. I gathered a few possible symptoms, and this is certainly not the, we'll go to the next slide. Yeah, so this is not a full list. This is just sort of a general list. You might come to me with symptoms of headaches and or migraines. You might have neck pain. Uh, you might experience nausea, dizziness. You might be sensitive to noise, sensitive to light. Or you might come to me and say, I have balance issues and I get much worse when I'm quite tired. So those are kind of some ideas of what you might experience. You might also have some weaknesses and we can talk about that a bit later. So again, this is not a full list, but just sort of a general idea of what might come to what might be the symptoms. So then I make a decision um, and we'll go to the assessment. During the assessment, I, I pick a bit what kind of assessment regimen I want to do with this particular person. Um, I might um, use what is called the headache disability index, which is a self-reported sheet. So if anybody, if you guys can see, I'm gonna show you. Maybe you can see something it's called, I'm not sure if you can see that, right? So it's really a list that allows you to fill in a lot of the symptoms that you have that come to headaches. It could be related to traveling, could be related to, um, you know, so, so I'll, I'm not gonna go into details, okay, sorry. Then there is the neck disability index. Same kind of idea, a bit different. Again, it basically allows you to fill out how you feel about your neck. Does it stop you from doing the things that you like to do? The one, the one area that I like to always approach uh, individuals with is with a measure that helps me make decisions, which is heart rate. So we're using heart rate during some kind of exertion. So we give you a choice if it's a treadmill, a bike, is it maybe just walking? And we measure your heart rate. And as we walk or as we ride the bike, I'm gonna be looking at your heart rate, see how it goes up, how it moves down, how do we can we manipulate it? And then I'm gonna ask you about the symptoms and see if your symptoms get worse as you do this exercise. So, that gives me a number. And let's just say that at 110 beats per minute, you start, your headache starts increasing. So then I know that 110 is that ceiling that I'm gonna use. So I will then describe a bit more what we do during the intervention about that. Um, it, during the assessment, I also am gonna look at range of motion. Um, and range of motion also includes what I call functional mobility. And functional mobility is really everything we do. Uh, we reach, we go from sit to stand, we stand up again, we walk, we, um, we bend over and get something from the floor. All these functional abilities are going to give me a lot of um, information about how your joints and your muscles are working. Um, again, so we talked about sit to stand, stand to lying down. How do you do that? Do you, do you go straight on your back? Do you turn onto your side? How do you do these things? How do you get onto the floor? How do you get back up? Can you do it? Can you not? Um, so that's sort of the functional mobility piece that I like to look at. I might pick a balance test. We have a couple of um, balance tests. One is more for to discover if you are at risk of falling. And another one is much more, a much higher level balance test. And I'll pick the one that suits your abilities best. And we'll discuss it and we will make a decision together if that is what you want to do. And that will give me some kind of um, an idea, a number, and it also is gonna let, allow me to see how do you do certain things. Um, I wrote down Buffalo concussion treadmill test, which is the same thing as the heart rate readings during a treadmill. So just to let everybody know, I will also use the analog pain scale. You see it on the side there. Um, I will ask you, what's your headache like today? 
and hopefully you will tell me it's a five out of 10 or it's a four out of 10 or whatever that is. Okay, because I can't read your headache. I only, it's only you who can determine what that number is. All right, so then I decide based on my assessment values, what I'm going, what we're going to do. And we're gonna discuss that. Um, the first thing before, we're gonna to go to the intervention options slide. One of my favorite questions to ask, there's two favorite questions I have, is what are your goals? What do you want to achieve? So I'm hoping that maybe um, amongst the individuals that are here right now, you might, guys might want to think about what are your goals? What do you want to achieve in life? What, what is it that you're not doing right now that you would like to do? I mean, we have to be <laughs> reasonable, of course, right? And it has to be within the physiotherapy kind of guidelines. Um, so during my intervention, I'm going to start thinking, okay, this person would like to walk again. Let's just say that's what it is. And I'm going to use, the first thing I'm going to use is I'm going to use the heart rate measure that you, we found out that ceiling. And I'm going to say everything that we do, we're going to do to 110 beats per minute. And when you get to that ceiling, you're going to make a change. You're either going to stop what you're doing, or you're going to change what you're doing, or you're going to, if you were walking fast, you're going to walk slower, or you are going to change your body position while you're doing it. Um, so there's many ways to pace an activity. It doesn't always have to be stop, but I'm going to use that 110 beat per minute. I'm going to let your heart rate come down, and then we're going to resume the activity that we're doing in the first place. So that's how we're going to use heart rate. And that can happen with anything we do. It doesn't matter what activity I do, even if I do a passive kind of treatment uh, modality, I might use heart rate just to give me information. Um, other intervention options, these are just options. It doesn't have to happen, but I'm going to use, I use them as something that I frequently do. Uh, we're going to improve your functional mobility. So. If you are having trouble going from a standing position to a sitting position, if you kind of plunk into the chair, you can't control the movement down, then we're going to work on those muscle groups that require, that will allow you to do that in a more controlled way. Um, overall, we're looking at improving strength to be able to participate in the things that you like to do in your functional mobility. So again, if you would like to be able to walk better then we're going to, but you have to get out of the chair. So you have to be able to create the power to go from sit to stand and from stand to be able to walk. So we're gonna have to work on those functional mobility pieces. Um, we're going to support all these exercises with other techniques, manual lengthening techniques, uh, acupuncture, massage, there's all these other tools that we have in our hands that we can use as well during our physiotherapy treatment, laser, uh, electrotherapy, there's, there's quite a few. Um, so that's, I just wanted to mention that as well. Um, how do we measure these improvements? So if I've done a, a balance test with you, let's just say you scored 61 out of 95 because one of the tests goes right to 95 it goes to 95 because you get extra points if you do a really really good job so uh 61 out of 95 so if suddenly your balance test improves and it's 70 we know you've made some improvements right you might tell me that your pain is less so we know that on your analog pain scale you have improved or maybe your headaches are less frequent. That's another way of saying it. You might, um, there might be a change in your mobility. So you tell me, look, when I go from sit, from stand to sit, I don't need to use my hands anymore. Okay, that's an improvement. Okay, so those are the ways we measure. And there is a few other ways. Okay, so let me now go to my next one. And things don't change that much as we move through uh, through now. We're going to go to the hemiparesis, right? Yes. Okay. So the reason why I picked hemiparesis is simply 
a way to describe when somebody has neurological changes to one side of their body. And the truth is every brain injury is different. Uh, they, there is no book that can describe all of them. Everybody is completely different, but often, not always, often, it presents like a hemiparesis. Hemiparesis mean one arm, one leg, one side of the trunk don't work so well. Sometimes it's part of the face as well. Um, and it's not everybody. Sometimes it's both sides, right? So for the purpose of this presentation, I chose the hemiparesis. And, and there's also other conditions that we might not think as a brain injury, but it is, which is, for example, somebody with a stroke. It might not be a traumatic brain injury, but a stroke is a brain condition that causes the hemiparesis. And we treat them very, in a very similar way. So what are the possible symptoms? On the next slide. So, so Somebody with a hemiparesis might come in with changes in sensation and proprioception. And I'm sure proprioception is a word that we've heard, but we don't really know what that is. So I'll, I'll explain in, in, in better terms. So sensation, first of all, could be you can't feel, feel uh, hot or cold. You might not be able to feel light touch or you might not be able to feel pain. And proprioception is more the position of your joint. So when you are, I'm assuming everybody is sitting, most of us anyways, um, you know where your body parts are. You know your arm, my hand right now is on my cheek. Um, I know that my other hand is on the table. I know my feet are on the ground. I know my knees are bent at 90 degrees. So that is the body's ability to know where you are in space, okay? And that is important. That is really important information that the brain needs to relearn sometimes, especially when we have a, hemi, a hemiparesis. Um, other symptoms, uh, changes in, in range of motion, uh, changes in maybe your elbow being able to extend fully or your shoulder being able to go up, um, changes in strength. You suddenly cannot open your hand to grab an item. Um, changes in muscle tone. And I'm sure individuals with hypertonicity know all about this. They know that the hand closes, sometimes, not always, and then we have difficulty opening it. Um, there is significant changes in functional abilities. Again, reaching, walking, gripping. Uh, Sybil, I think you're frozen or I'm frozen. Uh, sorry, everyone, just hang on. Can anyone hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. And I think. Sybil okay, that's good. Thank you, Pearl. Um, oh. So it might be. Uh, just Sybil then, sorry about this. Um, okay, so I'm gonna imagine she's gonna join us. Again, this, uh, this happens. <laughs> Sure, I can see her if she comes back. Oh, there she is. Hi, Sybil. Yeah, there we go. I'll just unmute. Me? Hey, oh. hi, welcome back. Woo. Sorry, I think I lost my internet. It looks yeah. like it was gone. I apologize. It happens. All these fun things that happen with, with technology. Yep, yep. I was at walking, okay, and balance, all right. So with somebody with significant ambulatory gait, walking difficulties, all the same words, just bigger words again, I might pick an easier balance test. I might go to what's called the Berg balance test, 
which is not as demanding as the other one. But I might have to go to the bigger one because this person is a sports person and they would like to go back to sports and I really need to see what can they do that is more challenging. So we pick and we decide what we do at that time. Um, What's muscle fatigue? I mean, people get fatigued, right? They get tired of how they do things. So very typically in, in, um, in the neurological interventional world, I always say we don't want to do as many repetitions. We want to just work with maybe five, maybe two, maybe five, maybe two times five, but not the typical go to the gym, do three sets of 10. Okay, so just to understand how we sometimes manage that muscle fatigue. Another symptom is difficulty with coordination, right? Coordination to be able to pick up a glass, coordination to hold a glass and not drop things, uh, coordination to do little things with your fingers. So all these things, all these um, symptoms come into place. All right, we're gonna go to the assessment, which is the next slide. Great, thank you. Um, again, we're going to do very similar things. We're going to do range of motion. I need to know if that shoulder that is affected can actually move to full range. Um, can they do it passively, where I basically pick the arm up and go up there? Can they do it and how far can they go actively? Um, I would like to um, think about functional strength. And again, if you think about a squat, we all have done, hopefully, um, a squat. So why do we do a squat? What, what, is, what happens in life that we need a squat for? Well, maybe through exercise, but that's the boring squat, in my opinion. The squat helps us to go pick up things on the floor. So if something falls on the ground and I'm standing and walking, I want to go pick it up and keep going. That's kind of a very normal thing to do. If I need to make my bed, I need to kind of squat a bit, and lean and reach forward. So these are the functional strength demonstrations that I might be looking for. Um, I'm, if somebody's in a wheelchair, I do definitely need to see how do they transfer. Do they transfer with help, without help? Do they use a sliding board? Do they stand up and then pivot and turn and sit? Or do they just straight go over from a wheelchair onto the bed, right? So I need to know how they do that because it again is gonna show me what their strength is all about. I might do another test that is called the stand up and go test, which you are sitting on a chair. I basically have a certain distance. I want you to get up, walk around, come back and sit down and I time it. See how long it takes you to do that. And that's kind of one of the tests because there's many little important pieces in that sort of test. We talked about the balance test. We talked about the Berg balance, which is a lower end test, not lower end, I should say that, um, a, a bit of a lighter type of balance test. And then there is the community balance and mobility scale, which is a higher level test. Um, Shadok McMaster uh, developed in uh, many years ago um, a series of assessment, um, yeah, assessment skills that is called Sages of Recovery, and it, they grade between one and seven. And we basically look and see where you fit in with your condition, and then hopefully we improve that. We work on that. And then I want to explore the client's goals. And then here's the second question that I love to ask, probably more than the first one. I love to ask people, what do they like to do? What's their thing? Everybody's different. I have people that say reading is my thing. Okay. Um, I have people that say rock climbing is my thing. Um, I have people that say I want to run a marathon again. That's their thing. Um, what did they do before the accident, not accident, the event that brought them here? Um, so people then, you know, I like to go fishing. I like, I like walking. I like walking my dog. I like to play with my grandchildren. Whatever those things are that you did before this whole thing happened is really important because that's information that is in your brain. It is in your memory. And your body knows how to do that. And we're going to tap into that because it's going to be important for what you want to do. I just had a young lady who came to me some years ago and she said, well, the doctor said, I can never, I will never ride a horse again. And I said, okay, let's see. 
And we worked with her, we worked with her, and then we pretended we, we don't bring a horse into the clinic. That would not be great, but I'd like to. Anyway, so we, we set it up. So she pretended she was climbing onto a horse. And one day she came back and she says, guess what? And she says, I, I actually rode my horse the other day. So that is that makes me quite happy. That is when we can achieve that, and that is awesome. Not always can we achieve that, but that is a lovely, lovely thing to do. Some people like to go skiing again. So we try, we try to get there. So the goals and the pre-event abilities are really important to me. All right, let's go to the next slide. So this is just a demonstration of a sliding transfer and somebody's ability. Right, you can see step one, I will have, my hands are doing a number of things. I keep her exactly where I need her to keep, stay so she doesn't slide forward. And then we slowly, it's called facilitate her to slide onto the board. And then we facilitate her to get onto the bed. And hopefully in time, she'll be able to do it by herself. Because some people, that's what they want. They want to be able to get into bed by themselves. And I mean, that would be nice, right? So if we can create that for, if we can build the strength to do that, that would be amazing. Because suddenly you can do things on your own and you don't need an extra person to help you. But not always, not everybody can do that. All right, we're gonna go to the intervention options. So again, we repeat again a few things and I added a few more, more, more interventions to it. Um, anytime you have, hypertonicity so you have a muscle that doesn't want to let go um, and that's what hypertonicity is it's a muscle that is contracted and just basically doesn't want to let go we got to lengthen that muscle we we've got to work with that we got to lengthen the muscle and at the same time we have to strengthen the opposite muscle so just to kind of put it out there um, and that's what the activation of the weak muscle groups is um, in the world of NDT, we don't talk so much about hypertonicity. We talk way more about the weakness of the opposing muscle. So let me just give you an example, a simple example, and I'll demonstrate. If you have a biceps that is always bent, your triceps, the back muscle here, is going to get very weak, right? So we have to activate the triceps, and then the biceps going to let go slowly. Okay, so we're going to do both. We've got to lengthen and we've got to strengthen, right? And how do we decide that? As we watch you move, we'll make, we'll, we'll know how to do that. Um, sometimes splinting is needed. And splinting is really a way to do what's called sustained stretch. So if your fingers are closed and you can't open them, I might put you in a splint that opens your fingers up and keeps you there. Or maybe in this position. So the splint will stay there. Hopefully you can sleep with it and you can actually give it on all night long. And then your fingers will be much more pliable and much easier to work with the next day. So we might talk about splinting. Um, I do a lot of education for caregivers as well. So anybody who's helping out, who's helping out at home with transfers, with moving, with getting things, um, caregivers always want to do a lot of a lot for the individuals that they're helping. I always like to start saying, okay, we need to do less. We need to let the muscles do the work. So I teach them how to do that. And hopefully it works out. Not always does it. Um, I'm going to do things like working on balance again with this person. Um, and balance can be done. And the, the reason why I wrote it down is because balance is not just about standing on one foot. Uh, everybody thinks I need to stand on one foot and then my balance is okay. No, it is balance is sitting. So if you can sit unsupported on a table, bed, with your feet on the ground, then at least I know that you can hold your trunk nice and straight. If you can sit there and move your arms around, put a sweater on, take it off, then I already know that your dynamic sitting balance is okay. Um, and then we talk about standing and then we talk about walking, right? So balance is really in every single position. So I want to make sure that I don't skip that. I can't go right to standing balance if your sitting balance is not great because I need your sitting balance to get better. 
Um, I always want to make sure, and I speak to this with, with many individuals, that your range of motion is optimal. Um, if, you're, if you're sitting and your hips are at 90 degrees and you can't go past 90 degrees in your hips, you can't move forward, you're going to have a really hard time standing up. You're going to use your hands continuously just to give you an idea. So I want to make sure that your hip flexion is better than what you showed me in the beginning. So I always want to work on range, range, shoulder range, elbow range, hand range, whatever that is. And again, education, education to understand what we're doing, why we're doing. I think that's important. I always say to clients, I talk a lot. Um, let me know when you've had enough, because I want you to understand why we're doing what we're doing. Let's go to the next one. How do we know we've improved? Well, a couple of other ideas. Um, I might do a step count. Um, and a step count is, um, you've seen all these step counters nowadays. We all have these watches and things that help us understand, oh, I did 10,000 steps today. Well, that's great. But I want to know over a certain distance, let's just say 100 meters, that you have, how many steps do you take within 100 meters? And somebody with a hemiparesis will likely have more steps than the more normalized walker. So my goal for this particular person is going to be to increase their step length. So in the end, my better outcome is going to be lesser steps in the same, with the same distance. So lesser steps within the 100 meters. Okay, so that's a way to actually measure that. Um, I would like to see about range of motion, right? Sorry for the sounds here. Um, I would like to see if somebody can move their arm to here. Well, if they, in a while they get to here, well, that's better, right? So we're going to see that. Um, maybe it's about resistance. Maybe they like to do free weights and I start them at five pounds and then in whatever, two months, they can now manage eight pounds. That's an improvement. Um, the speed to complete a task. Um, something that we've, doing, we've done a lot is what's called the six minute walking test. Um, basically, we just walk for six minutes, see how far you get in six minutes. And um, if, if it's an issue, we want to work on that. And then hopefully at the end of our session, you actually can walk that distance, six minutes, you can um, cover a greater distance in six minutes. Um, other ways to describe improvement is just asking, say, how are you doing? I mean, is your pain better? Is your pain worse? Um, what can you do now? What, what can you do that you couldn't do, do in the beginning? Can you now hold a cup of water? Can you pour a cup of water? Can you, um, uh, can you sit down without using your hands? all these kind of functional activities that you do during the day that will give us an understanding, okay, something is better. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna go to the last piece of, of the conditions that I picked, which neurological movement disorders, which might not apply to most of you, but I think sometimes it's worth mentioning because occasionally, um, not occasionally, often actually, I will see somebody with a brain injury that actually has underlying conditions that they came in from before. Um, I've seen a fellow with a brain injury who had actually a spinal cord injury on top of that. Um, I've seen uh, individuals with multiple sclerosis who had a brain injury um, or muscular dystrophies that had a brain injury. So I need to understand that um, what their previous history is and, and how that affects you. Uh, affects this particular person. Um, because we really treat all neurological disorders pretty much in the same way. We ask for the goals, we find out what you did before, and we figure out your weaknesses and your strengths, and then we go from there, right? So somebody with Parkinson's, let's say, um, a couple of possible uh, symptoms, and we'll go to the next slide again. So they might have symptoms that are a bit different. They are more 
um, what's called ataxia or tremors. Ataxia is, um, I, 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 the way I like to describe it to, to individuals is it's kind of the, the muscles going on and off. And so instead of being able to hold your hand in a nice steady way, it keeps, it keeps going on and off. It keeps going on and off, right? It doesn't stay and sustain that position that you wanted it to hold. So holding a glass of water is, is quite, a, quite a big effort. Um, people with these conditions have global weaknesses. They might not be specific to one side or the other. They're like everywhere, might be a triceps, might be a quad, might be a hamstring. So you have to figure out which ones are the weaknesses. Um, but I still gonna look at their functional mobility, at their ability to go from sit to stand, their ability to transfer, that will give me that information. Um, some of them might have more global hypertonicity, right? They'll have two arms that go up like this here or shoulders that really go up, right? So I have to look at the whole picture. Um, something I didn't mention before are contractures and changes in joint, in, in the joint. So contractures are when you don't move a shoulder, for example, on a regular basis. If you keep it tucked in for a long time, that shoulder is going to get not just tight in the muscles, the joint is suddenly going to get stuck. And that's a contracture. It's when the joint can't move. If I can't take your arm and lift it up and put it over your head, then I know likely that there is a contracture. And those are tricky because they are very hard to get to fix. There's a couple of ways, again, that splinting, you know, could be, could be one way of doing it. So range of motion, again, is always impaired with these individuals because they have so much trouble moving. Um, we'll go to the assessment piece. Um, so all the, the picture demonstrates one piece of a balance test, which is the tandem walking. Um, you walk on a line and uh, for se seven or more steps, and that's part of your tandem walking. But in the assessment for somebody with a neurological condition like Parkinson's and MS, and I still will do all sorts of other things. They come, they might come in with a headache as well because their shoulders are always up or one side is up and their neck is out of sorts. And so I want to do some neck and some headache disability indexes. I might also want to know what their heart rate readings is because they might not, I might not have to put a ceiling on them, but I might want to understand when they get tired because people with these neurological conditions have, they're so deconditioned because they stop moving that I need to use heart rate to help them move forward in an easy way, in a gentle way, but I might use heart rate and I might not. I mean, that's, that's the decision I make on the spot. I want to know what their range of motion is, what their functional mobility is, what are they able to do? What the, is it that they can't do? Um, again, back to the sit to stand, standing and getting into a lying down position, um, going onto their belly. Do they ever go on their belly? Some people don't even go on their belly, not even for a moment. And that's an interesting factor. It's, 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 it's a good thing to be able to do. It's just to go on your belly for just a moment for whatever. So maybe get up on hands and knees or for whatever. Um, I will do balance testing and I'll pick my balance test. Um, I, I'm going to identify which areas are weak, which muscles have high or low tone, and where are the tremors or the ataxia? And when does it show up? Because sometimes when you look at somebody and uh, you might've seen people with Parkinson's, I'll use that example, where you see them sitting and their arms are kind of on the armrest and there's nothing really, there's nothing shaking, nothing, nothing out of sorts. But as soon as they lift their arm up in the air, that's when you see it. Um, Strength testing is, is important and I like, I'm much more functional. I see strength as, a, as an activity. I see it within an activity. I don't do the typical strength testing that was taught in school actually. So I use, um, you know, if you can squat, can you squat to a third? Is it a full squat? Can you get on the floor? Can you get up from the floor? That sort of thing. All right, how do I know that this person has improved? Same as before. We go to the next slide. Um, 
I think there was one before that, but that's okay. I'll just say it quickly. The ability to complete a functional task without assistance is a, is a, is a way to assess. Um, I think the previous one, sorry. Nope, maybe you don't have that for some reason. Okay, I'll just describe it. Yes, there we go. Um, the ability to complete a functional task without assistance. Okay, uh, a, a transfer from your wheelchair to the bed. If you need a person, you need assistance. If you get stronger, you might be able to do it on your own. So that is an improvement. Um, again, improved range of motion and strength, um, improved balance scores. Um, I might be able to increase your ceiling heart rate. Um, I might be able to um, see you walking for longer distance or managing stairs. So those are the kind of improvements I like to look for. So on the, I'd like to just take you through a couple of intervention options um, at what I call the level of function of, of an individual. And what's the level of function? So the level of function is again, if somebody, um, if somebody, whatever you are able to do at this moment when I see you is your level of function. So if I ask you to go from sit to stand and you need to use two hands, then that's your level of function. And I take it from there. Okay, so that is um, how I start you. That's sort of the ceiling for me to get started and working towards what you want. So for example, often I get people to say, I just want to be able to dress myself, not have somebody help me with it. But if this person has difficulties getting out of bed on their own, I know that getting dressed in bed, let's just say the top of your body, is quite hard. It's much easier to do when you're sitting at the side of the bed and you have nothing behind you. That's how we put sweaters on. That's how we put shirts on, right? So I might start working on skills that move you from your line position to sideline. I might then move from the sideline position to learning for you to get into sitting position. Then I have to work on your balance in sitting. Once you can sit on your own, I'm going to start moving your arms. I'm going to start practicing how to put a sweater on and sitting when nobody is there. So that's how I progress things. So when somebody says, in, I want to dress myself independently, I don't go straight to the dressing part. I might first work on your ability to sit unsupported. So that's kind of the progressions that I how I approach it. Um, if somebody says to me, I would like to do independent wheelchair transfers. Um, so I might have to make a decision. First of all, I need to know what their bed looks like. Um, is it a soft bed? Is it a hard bed? Can the bed move and parallel itself to the, to the wheelchair? If the bed cannot move down to the wheelchair level, I cannot use a board because the board is going to be all crooked and now you have to work yourself up a slide. So it's important to ask those questions. Um, but if, if the bed can move down to the level of the chair, then I can start thinking, let's use a sliding transfer and work on those muscles. Um, if somebody that wants to transfer um, is, is having trouble with that, those tremors, with that ataxia, I might start working on hand placement. How do you place your hand so it's steady and will give you the support that you need to do that transfer? So we take into account where you're at and what you want to do and hopefully fill the gap between one end and the other. And that's how we do the work. So on my last slide, in conclusion, I'm going to say it is this, I call it skills training. Skills training is anything that you want to do. As, uh, we're going to go to the next slide. Skills training is, a, is, is based on the client's goals. I'm not going to get somebody to do wheelchair transfers if they want to work on walking, because they're probably not in a wheelchair and they don't need that. Um, it, is, it is the base of our approach to restore functional ability. So it's how we work towards you being able to do what you need to do. Um, but it's only through the practice of these skills that you're going to create new pathways in the brain. Remember those old memories that you have from the stuff you did before and try and 
kind of fill that gap again, let the muscles learn how to do that kind of job. And that is going to restore what I call optimal functional abilities. Optimal meaning might not be perfect. It might just be better. It might be significantly better so it satisfies your needs. So it's different for each person. And it's never perfect. I'm always say, I always, people always think they have to do things perfectly. Uh, absolutely not. Just, just do what you can and we'll try and progress that. You just have to try and practice. And that's really all we need to do. And that's all I got. Thank you for listening. <laughs>